Welcome to Badminton Unlimited, your weekly access to badminton and beyond. This week, Denmark's Mike and Frogger and Sarah Tusen share with us their aspirations as they map their plans for the future in women's doubles. And we report on yet another successful staging of the BWF World Junior Championships held in Indonesia. Five? Five years ago. Five years ago. And we played for the same club and um, Mang is four years younger than me. Yeah, I think uh, we were a great match. I think I was uh, 17 when we started playing together and then I think Sarah had a lot of experience uh, that I didn't have so she could give me a lot and give me a little bit more comfort on court uh, when I was really nervous so it was really good for me. Meet Mike and Frogo and Sarah Tusen, Denmark's number two women's doubles pair after Camilla Ritter-Yule and Christina Pedersen. Currently ranked 22nd in the world, the duo has been making good progress since winning their maiden international title at the Belgian International two years ago. It was a very great moment. I think we beat a Malaysian pair in the final, so we also knew that Asian couples are always very good and, um, and they also played very well. We have always enjoyed playing there. So that was also quite special. And uh, yeah, it's just nice to win a tournament. <laughs> Last year, Mike and Sarah enjoyed more breakthrough performances in their career. They opened 2016 with a title win at the Swedish Masters and were part of the formidable Danish women's team that clinched Denmark's fourth European women's team championships. And in the individual European championships, Mike and Sarah grabbed bronze. Their impressive performance against Bulgaria's Gabriela and Stephanie Stoeva in the quarterfinals was most satisfying and the triumph was a big boost for the young pair. We played the Stoeva sisters for like <laughs> seven times and lost. So that was really helpful to because we know it's so mentally hard to play against them. So yeah, for me it was just the winning moment against them, it was not that it was in the quarterfinal of the European Championships, it was really just the win against those girls. Uh, it was really, really good for us, that helped. The pair attributed their results to their tight friendship off court. The different personalities of the girls have played a crucial role in the success of the partnership. We have maybe a little bit more understanding um, because we are also very different and maybe that also helps to understand why we each other do does some things and uh, why we're doing it and yeah, I think it, it helps. As Sarah said, it really helps for me that I can have someone that I can talk to outside of court instead of just only when we have to play and only about badminton, we can talk about everything in life. So if I have some troubles with other stuff, I think I can talk to Sarah about it and then she can, yeah, she understands me uh, quite good because, yeah, we have so many years together. The Danish team is not short of world-class talent and with a pool of top-ranked players to spar with and learn from during training sessions, Sarah and Maiken have the support they need to become a top pair. The two aspire to one day follow in the footsteps of their very experienced and accomplished seniors, Camilla Ritter-Yul and Christina Pedersen. I think for us it's good to have somebody to look up to and uh, to see can we use some of the stu stuff that they're working on uh, in our doubles. Yeah, I think they are uh, a good couple and uh, I think they have found a way um, also like mentally uh, the small things that they need to do, they are really good, uh, both on court and outside court, to, um, to figure out what works for them and what, do, and what doesn't work for them. Of course, they inspire us and of course, it's also important to have those kinds of couples uh, when we are practicing and, and in the environment to, to get an understanding on, on how it, it, it can be done. This year, Mike and Sarah have attempted greater challenges by competing in the top tier tournaments. With women's doubles getting more intense with every competition, Mike and Sarah know they have to work hard to establish themselves. It's always tough on, uh, on the super serial levels. Um, 
Uh, for now, it's like we are really, really happy when we win our first round uh, because there are so many good players and so many upcoming uh, couples uh, that even if we don't know them, they are like really, really good. Um, so we always take uh, one match at a time, but it's really difficult to get a good draw. <laughs> um, we always look forward to um, to go out and play and compete uh, on, on that high level. And uh, we always uh, try to go for a win. <laughs> the Danish tandem have had encouraging results at the Super Series level. They came close to reaching the semi-finals at the Australian Open last year and at the India Open this year. Yeah, but still a little bit disappointed because in India we were quite close to getting to the <laughs> to the semi-finals actually. So yeah, it's it's good that we are getting closer, but still they need some small things all the time uh, to be worked on, and we just have to keep on working. And and then I think there will be more often times where we are in the quarterfinals or semi-finals in those tournaments. The pair are not looking too far ahead. Their focus is to keep pace with their peers and to make sure that their partnership is set on a solid and secure foundation. It's still working on, um, on the Super Series levels and, and try to do it as good as we can. And then uh, we also need to look at the practice and, and have some, some small goals, some, some part-time goals and then work from there because yeah, of course we have a dream and a goal in the future, but we need to take a small step at, the, at a time and then uh, work from there. So we always can see that we are improving and if we are not improving, then we need to do something something about it. Mike and Frogo and Sarah Tusen have time on their side. With hard work, they will hope to set new benchmarks for Danish women's doubles badminton. It's trivia time and this week we want you to name the first Thai player to win the Denmark Open. Have a think and we'll reveal the answer after the break. When we return we find out why women's singles has developed into one of the most exciting disciplines in badminton. Before the break, we wanted you to name the first Thai player to win the Denmark Open. The answer is Tanonsak Sensumbunsuk. The 27-year-old became the first player from Thailand to stand on top of the podium at the Denmark Open last year. Sensumbunsuk vanquished Son Wan Ho of Korea in straight games to clinch his first ever World Super Series crown. This year, Ratchanok Intanon became the second player from her country to win a title at the tournament in Odense. The women's singles final at this year's Total BWF World Championships in Glasgow served up an all-time classic. The epic match that lasted close to two hours epitomized the finesse, agility, artistry and mental strength typical in today's game. Former shuttlers Pi Hongyen and Xu Huaiwen, who were in Scotland for a presentation on the changing trends of women's singles at the World Coaching Conference, shared with us their thoughts on why it has become one of the most exciting disciplines in badminton. From our side, we see it becomes very, very physical. The speed and the consistency are very, very crucial. As playing against Karolila Marain, PV Sindhu, they are representing the trends of, uh, of women's singles nowadays. They play fast, they are very powerful, and they uh, implement a lot of men's style into um, women's uh, games. Since hanging up their competitive rackets in 2009 and 2012, Former German player Xu Huaiwen and French player Pi Hongyen have been actively involved in badminton through coaching and have over the years observed the development of the women's game. 
I think before when we play ladies singles, we were more focused on play a big court precision, and um, we play with um, a lot of variation of height and different height and then. Um, also, um, the game we trying to build up the game with more patience, more like play, uh, make player run and get the space and tucking afterwards. The Chinese one play the lady singles have a lot of advantage because they are really strong physically and very strong, very good technical and uh, so on. But um, today, when you observe the uh, the lady singles. And uh, they all face, um, play more powerful, more speed uh, in all of the games we observed. The Chinese were a dominant force in women's singles from the 80s, but since Thailand's Ratchanok Intanon broke China's hold on the World Championship's crown in 2013, the East Asian powerhouse's dominance has slipped. Before the Chinese players were leading because they are better in physical, also better in technicals. But today, the other countries are improving. They have also good physical, good condition physical, and to, to, to run on the court and to keep high speed and powerful. But the, while that, and they also improve in technicals. So the Chinese don't have that much advantage in that. In recent years, there has been a good spread of women singles winners across competitions. Six different players from five different countries have so far triumphed at 10 of the 12 MetLife BWF World Super Series tournaments this year. Notably, no Chinese woman has won a Super Series title in 2017 yet, and this is in stark comparison to their nine titles in 2012. There's more style of play now. Uh, Different style like um, Carolina, very great aggressive style, and uh, and uh, uh, like men single and smash net, and, uh, and then you have some um, style like uh, Yi in Tai Zhu Yin, who is a really uh, complex player. She can doing a lot of things and and the receptions and then. And, uh, but also you have like the short girl, like uh, Japanese girl, a uh, different style. But they all have a good technique, good um, technical, good physical condition, and the, the the gap is really reduced. We can observe today from country to countries. The emerging varied styles of play in women singles is one of the main reasons why the discipline has become more competitive and exciting than before. And there's more uh, playing styles which we don't see, say like. Um, uh, Carolina Marin, I think this kind of style, she's a very aggressive attacking player. In bef Before we don't see that much, and also they, they implement backhand serve, normally it's only in men's singles. Yeah, you're blocking to the, the middle to counter, uh, we don't do that. We use the net, use the space. Now the players use less um, the space, you know, use the height of the clears, you know, net spins, they are, they are more, but the rallies becomes longer. Um, the, the shots are not as accurate because of the speed is very high. The standard of badminton in women's singles is at an all-time high at the moment, and the very open field has made the competition decidedly exciting. With a number of young prospects emerging, women's singles is likely to grab a lot of attention in the foreseeable future. The MetLife BWF World Super Series made its 10th stop in Paris as the City of Lights welcomed top shuttlers for the Yonex French Open. The women's doubles contest opened proceedings on finals day and it was a battle between Korea's Lee So-hee and Shin Sung-chan and Indonesia's Gracia Polly and Apriyani Rahayu. Danisa Denmark Open champions Lee and Shin were looking to add another title to their names. But Polly and Rahayu clearly had other ideas. After taking home the first game, the Indonesians knew they were within distance to grab their maiden World Super Series title. The Koreans tried their best to stage a comeback in the following game, but their Indonesian opponents did well to hold their ground. The final score at the end of the match, 21-17, 21-15.
Mixed doubles followed next and it was a rematch of this year's BWF World Championships final. Zheng Siwei and Chen Jingchen were hoping to exact revenge against Tontao Yamad and Liliana Natsir. The Chinese world number one tandem began the first game brightly but struggled to hold on to their lead against the reigning world champions. The Indonesians were soon back on top for receiver, game. and went 1-0 up going into the second game. Zheng and Chen needed to step up their challenge to force the contest into a third game, but the experience of Ahmad and Natsir prevailed. 22-20, 21-15 was how the match settled, with the Southeast Asians walking away as champions. Men's singles saw a clash between Japan's Kenta Nishimoto and Indian ace Kadambi Srikanth. Making his debut in a World Super Series final, Nishimoto was eager to make an impression. He had a decent start in the first game, but Kidambi undid all that good work and the Indian shuffler went 1-0 up. With already a hat-trick of World Super Series titles under his belt this year, Kidambi had the know-how in his game to wrap up his fourth in the French capital. He was successful after 34 minutes, the final score 21-14, 21-13. Also eyeing her fourth World Super Series crown for 2017 was Chinese Taipei's Tai Tsuing when she faced Akane Yamaguchi in the women's singles showdown. The Chinese Taipei hotshot didn't waste any time making her intentions clear in the first game when she blew Yamaguchi away 21-4 in a one-sided contest. The Japanese world number five managed to reassert herself better in the following game, but Tai was always in control of the encounter, and Yamaguchi's challenge soon withered away. The match was over in straight games, Tai victorious with the final score 21-4, 21-16. Wrapping up finals day was men's doubles, and world number eight duo Li Jiehui and Li Yang were gunning for their first World Super Series title against Danish veterans Matthias Bo and Carsten Mogensen. Drawing encouragement from the win in their last meeting against the Scandinavians in India earlier this year, the Chinese Taipei players put themselves in the driving seat after grabbing the first game. The Danes tried to force the match to a deciding third game, but their opponents held firm right till the end. At 21 all, it was Bo and Mogensen who cracked first to hand the next two points and the title to Lee and Lee. Final score read 21-19, 23-21. After the break, we find out what the organizers have done to ensure a successful hosting of the World Junior Championships held in Jogjakarta. With digital innovation, shuttle time is now more fun, engaging and accessible than ever. So get connected to BWF's Badminton Schools program. Find out more about BWF's grassroots initiatives on these platforms. Download the app, visit the website and get active on Facebook. Your gateway to shuttle time has never been so easy. When it comes to hosting the biggest badminton competitions, few can rival Indonesia. The BCA Indonesia Open exemplifies this best. The BWF World Super Series premier event is the country's annual badminton extravaganza that has never disappointed both players and fans with its generous hospitality and electrifying atmosphere. So with this year's edition of the BWF World Junior Championships held in Yogyakarta, it was always going to be given the same royal treatment when it returned to the Southeast Asian nation since its inception in Indonesia in 1992. The first one is individual, so there's no the uh, mixed team. And this time it's a mixed team and individual one. So like uh, after 25 years, I mean like, you know, we call it a quarter of the century. I think it's a good number to bring them back. That's the reason why uh, this time we really uh, 
do the best, provide the best for the, uh, the players. In its 19th installment, the Premier Junior Badminton Competition travelled to Jogjakarta, and Badminton Unlimited was on the scene to find out how the young participants were charmed by their Javanese hosts. Jogjakarta is a good place where education is a priority and it's a city that is rich in history, especially in the cultural sense. From this perspective, it is a good learning experience for the young players coming from all over the world. And of course, Jogjakarta has a venue that's able to facilitate a big event such as the World Junior Championships with its eight courts. While the unique off-the-field experiences were a crowd-pleaser, organisers weren't distracted from their priorities. Top of this list was a well-planned and purposeful badminton environment for the players, and it became the immediate focus even before the tournament got underway. A training camp led by Indonesian doubles legend Christian Hadinanta was a big pre-event highlight. We uh, joined uh, with the uh, local PBSI, and then actually we played almost like a year ago. I mean, uh, we have the, uh, you know, in mind, we want, to, we want to break the record more than 60 countries. So, I mean, the, uh, we already like, you know, lobbying many countries, like, you know, way ahead. And then we provide the pre-event, the uh, training. And because we thought like, you know, will be many countries from the uh, far away that like, you know, uh, could be worthwhile for them to have the pre-event training with uh, Christian Harinata before they came in. Even after hosting the BWF World Championships two years ago, the country's administrators of the sport anticipated a different challenge for the junior event. With a tournament record of 64 competing nations, plenty of behind-the-scenes work had to be done to ensure all 488 players were well looked after during the 14-day event. At the 2015 World Championships in Jakarta, the number of competing players wasn't as big as it is here. It's a positive thing because when we decided to hold the World Junior Championships, we had ambitions to break the record, and thank God, we managed to do it. In the Mixed Team Championship, we had 45 nations, while in the individual event, we were able to attract 64 countries. It's a new record that has never been achieved in the world junior level. The big challenges were, you know, of course, uh, we should have a like, three hotel at the beginning, now turn into like a six hotel, so meaning the uh, transportation and then the hiring uh, more the liaison officers that speak different languages and also uh, getting more uh, warming up courts, usually two, now we have four and also the uh, play lounge that we have to make sure that we have enough enough snacks and the hot food for the, everybody. The organizers' generosity wasn't lost on the young players. All players were thankful for the hospitality. The city is very good. The food is the best. I really like Indonesian food. The, all of the people are very kind and yeah, that's why I love Jogjakarta and especially Indonesia. It feels great to be here playing against uh, top players. Like today I played against uh, China for girls doubles and it was a great experience. At the end of the day, the biggest beneficiary is the sport itself. As one of the traditional powerhouses of the game, Indonesia is doing its bit to help badminton grow in popularity. One of the key conditions for badminton to stay in the Olympics is that the game is played by as many nations as possible. It has become a moral obligation for Indonesia to share our badminton resources with those developing nations so that badminton will be enjoyed by everybody in the world. This will in turn strengthen the sport status at the Olympics. More than just a perfect platform to catch the stars of tomorrow, the BWF World Junior Championships 2017 proved that a badminton event can be an opportunity for enabling new experiences and to create lasting relationships. Let's take a look at the tournaments coming up in the next few weeks in our Badminton Unlimited calendar.
Next week, we are in Kuala Lumpur to catch up with Malaysia's Go Soon Huat and Shervan Jamie Lai as the country's rising mixed doubles pair talk to us about their flourishing partnership. See you next week.